We're here this morning. I wanted to、um, get us started on talking about the 2017-2018 season.、Um, as we announced about two years ago, that will be my last season. So it's going to be a combination of my last season as music director, and for that, I'll be conducting five of the classics. Some Sundays, some Tuesday, a couple that are both performances, and then you'll have a chance to meet the next set of candidates、uh, to be my successor. And、um, I, Carolyn Nishan, will talk about that today.、Um, I will say that I've seen what's coming on that side of things, and I think you're in for a really great ride next year as you get to see a lot of different conductors come through here. Um, okay, so for the first part of the, this time this morning, we're going to talk about concerts I'll be doing.、Um, I'm opening the season with、um, this concert. If some people may recall that in my audition concert、uh, back in 2006-2007 season, that was in the fall of 2006, I opened that concert with a work by a living composer named Arturo Marquez, Mexican composer. He Has written many works, but I think by far his most famous is this one, the Danzón Número Dos, Danzón Number Two.、Um, it's Marquez, who is Mexican from、uh, the area around Mexico City, writing what he sort of thinks a Cuban a cafe in Cuba, a nice sultry cafe in Havana, might feel like if the combo of piano, violin, one bass, and clarinet. It finally expanded into a full orchestra. It's an amazing piece, and so I, if you remember that, I hope it brings you fond memories of this chapter in the PSO's life.、Uh, next, the organist James Jones, who is also my partner, is going to play the Hans Andre Stamm Organ Concerto. Now, I'm sure you all have been listening to that for just years and years. No, it's not as well known of a concerto as the Jungen Concerto or the Poulenc Concerto, which we've done here for organ in the past few years. But、um, we discovered this. Jimmy and I discovered this piece, and both have fallen incredibly in love with it. It's a perfect showpiece for this unbelievable instrument sitting on stage right behind me, the Kachmar organ. So we wanted to make sure we celebrated that as well. And then、um, one of the earliest pieces I did was the Mussorgsky Ravel Pictures at an Exhibition. If you're wondering about the slash,、uh, Mussorgsky wrote these, these works. For these movements for piano, and then a number of composers,、uh, including Ravel, including Rimsky-Korsakov,、um, fleshed it out for full orchestra. But the most famous by far is the Ravel orchestration. So I think that's going to be a great opening night for us, a very celebratory way to kick off this exciting 17-18 season. The beginning of this、uh, transitions are always exciting, and I think you're going to have a lot of fun throughout next year. The next concert we're going to. Do helps us to celebrate that Leonard Bernstein is. We're celebrating the hundredth year of Bernstein. Now, Bernstein was born on August twenty fifth, nineteen eighteen, but the Bernstein Foundation has chosen to say that all of seventeen eighteen and all of eighteen nineteen. They'll sort of use both. <laughs> Crazy to、uh, celebrate the the season.、Um, We're, we're opening with a short work, which is only for a small chorus. We will have a small,、um, a chamber-sized chorus from Portland Choral Art Society. Will join me for a piece called the Book of Matthew. You're going to see two works on the season next year by Mason Bates. Mason Bates, I think many of you know this already. He's he's one of the most successful living composers today. He has his first opera. Based on the life of Steve Jobs, is premiering at Santa Fe Opera this summer.、Um, he has had several works now recorded, and even many Grammy nominations.、Um, works by the Chicago Symphony. He, two of his major orchestral works, Ricardo Muti, recorded recently with Chicago Symphony. Pittsburgh Symphony recorded his violin concerto. He was just named、um, the second most performed composer of orchestral music、um, in America after John Adams. He's also one of my closest friends in the world. I was a groomsman in his wedding. I've known him since he was 15, and he wrote a piece about eight years ago for the vocal ensemble Chanticleer, and it was a several movements, all poetry or in this case a bit of scripture, dedicated to the concept of sirens, such as the Lorelei, the text about the Lorelei on the Rhine, etc. In this case, the text is. Jesus saying to the fishermen, "Cast your nets on the other side," and then he said, "I will make you fishers of men." But the setting of this choral、um, work is incredible. 
it's, I, I misspoke, it was originally for Chanticleer a cappella. For us, Mason made an arrangement that will be with a small choir and organ. And this will be the premiere of this version of this piece. So then comes Bernstein's Symphony No. 1, uh, which is called the Jeremiah Symphony. Bernstein wrote three symphonies. Um, they all have interesting names. The second one is the Age of Anxiety. I thought about that, but I didn't want that to be something you thought about during your transition year. And that's for piano and, and orchestra. And the third symphony is the Kaddish, uh, which is a Jewish form of a requiem, really, a sort of prayer for the dead. And we've done that one here. We did that a uh, number of years ago, and it's an incredible piece. The one that has not been performed here, perhaps it has been, but it, not at least the last 25 years, is the first symphony, Jeremiah, which is uh, incredible reflective work and beautiful solo for mezzo-soprano. Stephanie Foley Davis is a great friend of mine. I've worked with her a lot. And I think you'll really love that sort of connection to Bernstein. No chorus in that. The big chorus happens after intermission, and we're playing a work by Carl Jenkins called The Armed Man. This might ring a bell for some of you because The Armed Man was performed by the Portland Choral Arts Society and the ballet about six years ago. It has not been performed here with orchestra. It's based on an old French War of the Roses era carol, the armed man, l'homme armé. And this tune begins the work. Then you have a bit of everything as Carl Jenkins examines war and eventually a call for peace. There's a Muslim call to prayer. There's a Kyrie and an Agnus Dei movement of the Latin mass. Um, there are poetry, um, poems about sort of the darkness of war. And finally, it moves to the same tune as the French carol, but now saying, better is peace than always war. Very powerful and, dare I say, timely piece that uh, we get to focus on this. So that's, um, if you don't know it, tell, give it a listen and then tell your friends about it. I, I think this is one of the most important new choral works um, that's come along in the last 50 years or so. That's October. And then the next one that I will conduct, there's one more piece on here that I'll tell you in a, in a moment, but it's a nice celebration of um, Mozart and Strauss. Now, it's a, it's a few days, it's a little after Mozart's birthday, 10 days or so, but we're close. So we're going to play the Mozart Piano Concerto number 20, that's the D minor concerto, and Henry Kramer is coming back. I was looking for connections with all of the five concerts that I do next year that have some kind of connection to me or a sentimental connection to my time here. Henry has played with us actually twice in the past 10 years and once he played Mozart he's going to do another Mozart this time. Henry is in the past year since he has played here his sort of accolades and awards and prizes and abilities to um, debut at several orchestras in Europe etc has only grown and you should be proud of that because he's from Cape Elizabeth. So it's really nice to sort of celebrate a local um, star, if you will. And we're going to finish with uh, Richard Strauss' Ein Heldenleben. And this is sort of Strauss's autobiographical um, sort of response to the world about his composition. Um, he references so many of his other tone poems in this work. Um, brilliant violin solos particularly. It's almost concerto for violin, if you will, in many places. Um, and he even responds to his critics in this piece. So a little bit of everything shows up in here. And by the way, it happens to be one of those Strauss tone poems that takes everything and the kitchen sink. It's just a tour de force work for orchestra. So li really looking forward to that. There's a sort of a blank space near the top, you see. And that's uh, waiting for one more piece. We know the composer, we just don't know the piece. Um, I'm working with the composer on picking sort of just the right one as, as I'm learning her works. Her name is Hannah Lash, and a uh, much uh, praised composer. And she came to me by a member of our family, a member of the audience, a very dedicated part of the PSO family, a man named Stephen Jenks. Stephen here? I don't see. Stephen Jenks, and he came to me and said, you have to hear this composer, Hannah Lash. She is incredible, and he starts rattling off the things she's done and her awards and her incredible pieces and her recordings, and then he said, oh, and she's my niece. Well, <laughs> turns out he was, he was right about her. She's the real thing. She's really incredible, and Hannah and I are sort of working now on the right piece, the right timing, etc., to fit with this. That's January, and then um, my penultimate concert 
is this concert. Um, I, I don't say it to, to audiences, I think, as much as I should, but you could say this about so many members of the orchestra, but certainly one can easily say that Charles Dimmick is one of the finest violinists playing anywhere. This guy's incredible, and I've, I really have enjoyed my friendship and my musical relationship with him for these past 10 years, so I definitely wanted to have my last season include a concerto from Charles. He's going to play the Samuel Barber Violin Concerto. The first movement of that concerto, is, all of them are incredible. The first movement just slays me. No one has ever captured a butterfly in flight, quite like Barber, in the first movement of this concerto. Uh, we open with the Brahms Academic Festival. Why? Because it's a personal favorite of mine. That's it's a no, no, no deep science in that one. I'm just crazy about the work. Then the Barber, and then I told you you would see another Mason Bates work. This is Alternative Energy, and this has been recorded and released and Grammy nominated by the Chicago Symphony with Ricardo Muti conducting. Um, he calls it his Global Warming Symphony. That's sort of the subtitle. It's in four movements. It feels like a, like a symphony. The first movement is Ford's Farm, um, 1896 or something, and it's, it's sort of the beginning of the Ford factory, the beginning of that kind of automation happening, and it sounds like a lot of sort of, you know, gears trying to get into place. Very beautiful tune, though, that's connected to it. And then the next movement is Chicago in 2012, sort of the height of where we are now in industry and energy. The third movement is set in China about 100 years in the future when China has sort of been overcome with all coal, ash, and smoke, and that's really moving throughout the planet, one could say. And then the final movement is set well into the future, maybe a thousand years, and it's in the, set in the tropical island of Iceland. Sort of give you a sense of how this piece goes, but it's a very moving work, and uh, just the orchestration and the musical qualities are phenomenal. And then um, we're doing a, we thought we would end with a little known piece, I'm sorry about that. You may not have ever heard of it, it's Bolero by Ravel. That was a joke. But we do, we do uh, enjoy playing Bolero and you know, in some ways it, it wasn't a joke but it was almost a bet by Ravel, seeing if he could take one theme and one theme only and just keep building the way he shapes it in color throughout the entire orchestra. If it makes you think of Bo Derek, it does me as well. Just I want to make sure you're clear on that. And then the final concert, um, I've decided that I would love for my swan song to be the Mahler Second Symphony, the Resurrection Symphony. Um, I'm, I'm very excited about the piece. We did it before. It's, it's interesting that my time here has had more connection for me personally to my actual birthday of May 2nd than, than any other place I've worked. I was hired for this position. I got the call to be, to be asked if I wanted to take this position on my 40th birthday, May 2nd, 2007. Uh, the first time when we did Mahler's Second Symphony in about 2009 or 10, it fell on my second birthday. When we had our 90th anniversary celebration, when the four living conductors of this orchestra had a concert together, that fell on my birthday. And this will be my last concert, which will finish the night before my birthday. Tuesday, May 1st. So that Mahler came to my mind. I will tell you, I thought of a, many other pieces. I thought of Bernstein Mass, but then I wasn't sure where we would find the you know, $7 trillion to pay for it. I thought about um, Britain War, Re War Requiem. I thought about, uh, very seriously, about the Verdi Requiem. But then I did recall that um, my wonderful predecessor, Toshi Shimada, finished his tenure with the Verdi Requiem. I thought maybe not two times in a row like that. Also, it dawned on me that the final words sung in the Verdi are liberame, free me. I thought that might not be the very best way to set that one up. The soloists um, are two incredible soloists. Twyla Robinson, you will hear next month if you come to the Brahms Requiem performance. She is our soprano solo. In fact, I've done Brahms about six times. I've only done it with Twyla Robinson. So I, I feel like I don't know how I would do it with any other soprano at this point. She's just phenomenal. And uh, Elizabeth Bishop has been with us before. I know her as Betsy Bishop. She uh, won the Met Opera Competition in 1994. She sings very consistently at San Francisco Opera, the Met, Washington National Opera, Chicago Lyric Opera. Um, she made her debut at Covent Garden at La Scala. I knew her since we were six years old. She lived down the street from me growing up, and in the first grade spring play, when they put all the first grade classes together, I was the MC in the spring play, and she was a jonquil in the flower scene. 
and we've been greatest of friends and music collaborators uh, ever since. I just did a wonderful cantaloupe work with her uh, with the Memphis Symphony two weeks ago. Um, and of course, the, our, it's not listed there, but of course our great uh, Choral Art Society will, will provide the huge heft and this ascension, resurrection into the heavens at the end of this piece. So those are the five times that I will get to be here and, and uh, have the great honor of waving my arms for this incredible orchestra a few more times. After this, just to tell you a couple other things before I um, ask Carolyn to come out, this is the um, concerts that are not our Pops concerts, not our Classics concerts. Um, there are a few, a few other things we do to be sure, but I want to make sure you to remind you we have our Discovery Concert Series going strong, just had an, an amazing concert that our assistant conductor Andrew Crest, Crest led just a couple of weeks ago. Um, these concerts you'll be getting tons of information about very soon. Youth concerts are where we bus in kids. Uh, we fill this, if you've never seen it, you should pop by sometime. We fill this auditorium to the top with uh, school age kids. Average age is fourth and fifth grade, but it's a sight to see and one of the most important things this orchestra does uh, where we get 45 or so minutes with kids a few times uh, in the year. And then our kinder concerts, these are where ensembles of the orchestra, string quintet, sometimes string quartet, uh, percussion ensemble, brass ensemble, woodwind ensemble, go out instead of them coming to us, we go to them, to um, elementary schools, to kindergartens, to other types of programs where kids are involved. Very, very important. Um, the bulk of these things are really masterminded by, not me, but by Andrew Crust, our assistant conductor. So Andrew, if you'll stand, let everybody make sure they know who you are. That's our assistant conductor, Andrew. Thanks. And we have one more, and that is the magic of Christmas coming up. And I will tell you that we have an, this is where we always are in about February of each year. We have an idea. We have a sort of a hazy construct in our minds of what magic is going to look like. We have reached out to some guest artists already. Um, but the, the juices really get flowing in earnest in the spring and summer as we plan magic. But, you know, we feel really good about this last year's magic. It was just a, a joy to be part of it. And we hope to, this, since this will be my last one, um, I'm really looking to, to make sure we knock it out of the park if at all possible. I'm saving any thoughts I have about May of 2018 until May of 2018. But now you know the part of the season that I'll be involved with. And again, it's just such an honor to have done this now for uh, 10 years, including my designate year. And I can't wait for this last one. Thank you guys very much. Hello, everyone. My name is Carolyn Nishan. And I'm the executive director for the Portland Symphony. Uh, before I jump in to uh, the announcement of our finalists, I want to again acknowledge Robert Moody. It has been 10 incredible years, and over his tenure, actually since he began, this orchestra has been operating in the black for eight consecutive seasons. He hired our assistant conductor position, first with Norman Huynh, and now with Andrew Crust. He began our discovery concerts, filling this space with children and their parents and their uh, grandparents, which has been wonderful. And he has uh, stayed true to what he hoped to bring to this orchestra, which was to provide accessible programming to age four to 104. And I'm just so grateful to have worked with him. And I know that so many people have fallen in love with this orchestra because of Robert Moody. And so I just want to do a give a round of applause. <laughs> So uh, I now want to talk to you about uh, the music director search process. We received 240 applications from individuals all over the world, men and women all over the world, that were uh, hoping to uh, take, a, take a chance and see if they might become the next music director of the Portland Symphony Orchestra. And it has been a real pleasure to work with the team of people on the Music Director Search Committee. I see many of them uh, sitting up front. If you guys want to stand up if you're on the search committee and, uh, and say hello. But this is, 
This team uh, has been, uh, is comprised of musicians, at least one musician from every section of the orchestra. We felt that that was incredibly important. So John Tanz Tanzer, uh, our principal timpanist, Charles Dimmick, our concertmaster, Nina Miller on horn, Lisa Hennessy, flute, Bill Rounds, cello. Uh, it is chaired by uh, Tim Boulette, his, who is on our board. Harper Lee Collins, who is our board chair, is also on this committee. Ken Spire, who is a past trustee. Debbie Hammond on our board, Mary Neal on our board, and it is administered by myself and Leah Pulio, our Director of Artistic Operations. And in any of our committees, we find it so important to have many different constituents coming together to make large decisions, and having that huge group of musicians is so incredibly important. So I just wanted to thank that group as we moved from 240, having interviews, uh, watching these conductors conduct, making sure, doing reference checks that uh, the musician voice was incredibly important in this process. So now, uh, I will, in alphabetical order, go through our four finalists. Each of them are going to be conducting one classics and one pops concert, and that will allow us uh, and the audience to be able to see these uh, individuals on stage twice, and actually for three performances. One of the classics and then the pops will be performed on a Saturday night and a Sunday afternoon. So, without further ado, our first candidate is Ken David Mazur. Uh, he is currently the assistant conductor of the Boston Symphony Orchestra, and he's also the uh, artistic director of the Chelsea Music Festival, and that is in New York. Uh, he has served as principal guest for the Munich Symphony, and he actually conducted in Portland in 2014 as a guest conductor. Uh, note that this concert, uh, it will actually, if you want to go to the concert slide, it will be on a Wednesday. As you might imagine, uh, having uh, many different candidates' schedules, guest artist schedules, Robert, Robert's schedule, sometimes we have to give a little bit. So this concert will be on a Wednesday, uh, November 15, and the program will feature uh, a, a close colleague of his, Ron Donk, on piano. So the program opens with the Wagner Tannhäuser Overture. And for those who don't know the story of Tannhäuser, I really recommend you check it out. It, uh, it involves a singing contest, betrayal, the Pope. Uh, it's a fascinating story and a, uh, a rather tragic end. So check it out before you go. Uh, come see the concert. Uh, List Piano Concerto Number no. 1, so that will feature Ron Donk. And Ron is a, an Israeli pianist. He's in his 30s. He uh, went to the Juilliard School of Music and has won uh, top uh, piano competition prizes. We'll be closing the concert with Brahms Symphony Number no. 1. Uh, some have called this Beethoven's 10th, and so I'm hoping that having a Beethoven 10th symphony on the program will not lead to any crazy weather in, uh, in November. Um, but this, uh, Brahms heard this uh, Alpine shepherd singing this tune, uh, high on the hill, deep in the dale, I send you a thousand greetings, and that has been woven into the uh, Symphony Number no. 1. Uh, we asked uh, Ken David about his inspiration behind the programs, and so I'll just read a little bit about what he had sent us. The programs that I chose together with the orchestra are very close and dear to me. While they show only a small sample of the music I'm passionate about, I wanted to give the orchestra and the Portland audiences a sense of my early musical upbringing in the first program. The classical program starts with Wagner, a composer born in my home hometown of Leipzig. The Tannhäuser Overture is actually the very first work for large orchestra that I ever conducted and brings back many wonderful memories from when I started out thinking about the meaning of conducting. Liszt was very close to Wagner, of course, and the two had many ties to Weimar, a city that is very close to Leipzig, and therefore I visited often. It was the center of modern thought and has also one of the most important orchestras that was conducted by Liszt himself. Brahms is a composer who makes me homesick, and both musically and spiritually, not because I'm German, but because I believe that when you hear the music, you cannot help but believe every thought it communicates, as his music is full of sincerity, depth, and hope. So that is his classical program. Uh, for his Pops program, he will be doing a tribute to the Oscars, and so that will look at many decades of movies that have been nominated or have received awards for Oscars, and will be leading up into the uh, nominating season. This program is going to be mid-January, and so uh, stay tuned. We're looking at potentially programming works of music that will be leading up to uh, the Oscar season. 
and it, it will contain some of the most well-known works uh, and uh, maybe a few more obscure ones that you might not be aware were uh, created by very well-known today classical composers. So uh, we asked Ken David what, uh, what makes him most excited about the possibility of being the Portland Symphony's next music director. Uh, and he said, it is a combination of things that makes me very excited about working with the Portland Symphony Orchestra. First, the people in the orchestra, as well as the organization, are extremely dedicated artists and professionals. Their awareness and enthusiasm of how music is life-changing to their community shows a great sense of motivation that inspires the highest level of music making and that I believe that will allow the orchestra to be a constant companion in people's lives. He, he went on to say that, uh, secondly, he loves this hall from having been here and guest conducted and uh, experienced his time in Portland and loved uh, the city and knows that it's a, a great and wonderful source for musical and cultural events. We also asked him uh, what he does in his free time and he said that he loves spending time with his uh, three young children, uh, his wife Melinda, they're always uh, on the lookout for fine cuisine, so I said perfect. Uh, Portland is just the place and um, he also said he likes to play table tennis and scrabble on his iPhone. <laughs> All right. Our second conductor, Daniel Meyer. Daniel Meyer is the uh, music director of the Asheville Symphony as well as the Erie Philharmonic. And uh, Daniel, he was uh, previously the resident conductor at the Pittsburgh Symphony. And he is uh, actually guest conducted here in 2006. He was uh, a part of the search process the last time around and uh, since that point has had a full decade of music director experience. Uh, he will be conducting a program of Tchaikovsky, Suite from Swan Lake, the Glazunov Violin Concerto, and Rachmaninoff Symphonic Dances. And uh, we will be bringing in Chi Yun, who is a uh, South Korean violinist. And Chi Yun also studied at Juilliard. She's performed all over the world. His pops program will feature the music of Rodgers and Hammerstein, so music from Oklahoma, The Sound of Music, King and I, South Pacific. He'll be bringing in a Broadway star, Lisa Vroman, uh, to join him on stage. And uh, when we asked about his inspiration behind his pops programming, he said uh, that Lisa is a dear friend of his that he's collaborated with on a number of occasions. And um, he sees her as one of the, the best talents to be emerging from Broadway uh, and thinks that he'll, she will bring incredible creativity to the, to the Rodgers and Hammerstein tribute. Uh, when we asked about uh, his, uh, what made him most excited about becoming the uh, music direct, potential music director of the Portland Symphony, he also shared uh, that he, his experience was so positive in, in 2006 when he was here, and it was a fantastic group of musicians, and he felt that with an enthusiastic audience, a beautiful concert hall, and a community that is so dedicated to great music uh, that he was very honored to be asked. Uh, off the podium, uh, he said he loved to be outdoors, uh, go to Pittsburgh Pirates games, and also said he was very interested in mechanical watches and art and architecture from the Art Nouveau era. So mechanical watches, pretty fascinating. All right. Number three, Alexander Micklethwaite. Uh, Alexander was also born and raised uh, in Germany, much like uh, Ken David. Uh, he was born in Frankfurt, and he is the music director of Canada's Winnipeg Symphony and has been since 2006. So similarly, a decade's worth of music director experience. His former posts, uh, he was the assistant conductor of the Atlanta Symphony as well as the Los Angeles Philharmonic. And uh, very similarly to Alexander, uh, he conducted here in 2006 uh, and since that point has uh, had 10 years of music director experience. So for his program, uh, he will be opening with uh, a living composer, living female composer, Anna Thorvald's daughter. She is Icelandic. And uh, the piece, uh, this aerialty piece, is a piece that was, uh, was composed for the debut of the Reykjavik Concert Hall, the Harpa. And uh, it, it, it's uh, written with uh, the state of gliding through the air with nothing or little to ho hold on to, as if flying. And the music both portrays the feeling of absolute freedom gained from the lack of attachment and the feeling of unease generated by the same circumstances. So this will open the work, or open the program. Uh, then Beethoven's Piano Concerto Number no. 5, and will be joined by Russian pianist Nat Natasha Peremsky. Uh, she was born in Moscow, came to the United States when she was about eight years old, debuted with the LA Phil when she was 15, and uh, has also won piano competitions and prizes all over the world. We'll close with Sibelius's Second Symphony, and uh, that, that piece and this program, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about 
what Alexander shared with us. He said, having lived for 10 years in Winnipeg, Canada with extremely cold winters, a famous lake landscape with 14,000 islands and a unique cultural scene gave me a personally deeper understanding of the darkness, vastness and beauty of Sibelius's sonic landscape in his second symphony. I can't wait to conduct in Portland. In Manitoba, we had the biggest Icelandic population outside of Iceland, which we celebrated several years ago in our contemporary music festival. Anna Thorvald's daughter, Ari Thorvald's daughter's Ariality is a beautiful depiction of the Icelandic spirit and forces of nature. And being German, Beethoven is of course one of the reasons why I became a conductor. His emperor concerto is majestic, virtuosic, philosophical, and will be a great counterpoint to the Sibelius Symphony. For his POPs program, uh, he will be conducting a program that ties in dance, and specifically ballroom dance. He shared a, uh, a fascinating story with us, apparently. He said, when I was 16, I went to, the ball to ballroom dancing lessons with all of my friends. It's just something we did at the time in Germany. Quite intimidating for me, the picking the girl part, but I fell in love with dancing. So this program is a wonderfully inspiring show that combines ballroom dance and symphonic dance orchestral music, two of my passions. Uh, he shared with us that uh, he's most excited about possibly becoming the next music director of the Portland Symphony uh, to uh, grow uh, the orchestra and to further connect to the vibrant community. He said that that's the work that he did in Winnipeg and uh, of making sure that the orchestra is truly meaningful to the community and that's what he would like to continue in Portland. Uh, not on the po when he's not on the podium, he spends time with his two boys and his wife. He plays ice hockey occasionally, soccer, and loves running and he said he enjoys reading nerdy books and watching shows like Outlander or Broadchurch. Our fourth and final candidate Eckhart Proy. Uh, Eckhart, you may recognize this name. He guest conducted here in 2011. He is uh, the music director of the Stanford Symphony that uh, tenure is wrapping up uh, this, uh, at the end of the season. He's uh, been in Spokane uh, for a number of years. Uh, he just won the Cincinnati Chamber Orchestra position, which is a summer program, and Long Beach was just named in uh, 16, uh, 1617 to begin in 1718. And when he won those that Long Beach position, he contacted me immediately and said, do not worry, I am absolutely excited about auditioning with the Portland Symphony. So we are thrilled to have him uh, join us back on stage. Uh, his program will be Zemlinsky's The Mermaid, and that is based on the Hans Christian Andersen uh, Little Mermaid. Uh, interestingly, this program, uh, as uh, we were looking into the history behind these pieces, so Zemlinsky was uh, Schoenberg's brother-in-law and also had a romantic entanglement with Alma Schindler, who is also uh, once married Alma Mahler. So if you know anything about the storied history of Alma Mahler and how she tortured many a, uh, many a male composer because they just fell in love with her. This piece was actually written after being rejected by Alma uh, when she chose Gustav Mahler instead. So it's a 40 minute work and is kind of the, the hefty work of the program leading into another bear of a, of a concerto, the Brahms Concerto for Violin and Cello. And you may see another familiar name on here. We'll be bringing back Joshua Roman. He joined us for the Bates Cello Concerto this year. And he'll also be joined by Caroline Goulding, who is a, a wonderful young violinist uh, that will be joining him on stage. To close the program, uh, we will uh, move into On the Beautiful Blue Danube by Strauss. And um, we'll see if there might be a surprise piece at the end of that program. Uh, inspiration behind uh, this program from Eckhart, he said, I like audiences to leave a concert feeling uplifted and whistling a tune. The Vini's journey proposed in this concert begins with fairly unknown composer uh, Zemlinski and his highly romantic and beautiful tale of the mermaid. Johannes Brahms was a great supporter of Zemlinski and is re here represented by his last orchestral work, his double concerto which features inspirations of folk music from nearby Budapest. The Waltz King Johann Strauss II celebrates the river connecting both cities, Vienna and Budapest, and his most famous work, with his most famous work, the, the Blue Danube Waltz. At the end of this concert, you'll be whistling or humming. So that is his classical program. And his pops program will be a program dedicated to all Gershwin. So you'll hear Rhapsody in Blue, and we'll be bringing a pianist on for that works like Embraceable You, Porgy and Bess, and we'll have uh, singer Jacqueline Boulier uh, joining Eckhart and the orchestra on stage. 
when asked about the inspiration here, uh, he felt that Gershwin uh, was, uh, if, if you're looking to bring in new classical music lovers, Gershwin is the way to do it. And because Gershwin kind of toe the line between both uh, jazz and classical, he's actually a really uh, wonderful crossover musician to be able to introduce people to uh, the pops genre. So that uh, was his inspiration behind the POPs program. And he shared with us that he still remembered conducting the Portland Symphony from a few years back. He said it was a great experience working with these fantastic musicians and excellent staff and performing in a wonderful hall. I also found the audience to be very kind, open, and receptive. <laughs> the symphony was uh, on the program was Bruckner, after all. And I would be thrilled to get to learn more about the orchestra family and audience and immerse myself in the city. I'm looking forward to work with the best musicians around and the Portland Symphony would definitely fit that bill. Uh, he shared with us he has two daughters and loves to spend time uh, with them, dive into their world. He loves traveling and wanted to share that he uh, thinks it's so important that he bring his children around to show them different cultures and travel with them all over the world, that um, you can learn so much from books and movies, but that traveling with, with, your, with your family provided his children uh, a new and an entirely different way to look at the world. So those are our four finalists, Ken David Mazur, Alexander Micklethwaite, Daniel Meyer, Eckert Proy, and we are just so thrilled, or so thrilled to get to share this season with you. So honored to be able to share Robert's 10th and final season with you all and celebrate him. Thank you so much for being here.